Happening right now, NYPD Commissioner Dermot Shea is holding a press conference right now in regards to an investigation involving guns. Let's listen in. Good morning, everyone. I am joined here by Cy Vance, members of his team, Chief of Detectives Jimmy Essick, members of his team, uh, specifically Chris McCormick, Assistant Chief Chris McCormick, and Brian Gill, who's going to be speaking shortly. Earlier today, members of the NYPD and our partners took into custody across multiple states four individuals, and the proceeds, some of the, some of the proceeds are laying here in front of you. I'd like to thank the U.S. Marshals, the ATF, the Manhattan DA's office, our critical partners on this case, and all the members of the gun violence team that worked on this case. This case started over a year ago with a field intelligence sergeant doing some darn good police work. It grew to what you see on the table before you here today. And before I turn it over to Cy, while we take pictures of these guns, and we've been in this room before doing these cases, I don't see guns on this table. What I see is victims. I see kids gunned down in the street. I see mothers standing at funerals. I see Jackie Rowe Adams in Harlem a couple weeks ago, reliving what she's gone through, and that nightmare play out over and over again. I, I can't thank Cy enough and the members of the team that are here today, and the FIO that started it is all the way on the right, for their work here. They carry on the work of two detectives, 2003, gunned down in Staten Island doing a gun buy. And I haven't mentioned the undercovers, officers that work this case, but think of the incredible bravery as they go into harm's way to keep New Yorkers safe. So Detective Andrews and Detective Namoran, we should all remember their sacrifice from 18 years ago, and we carry on their great work here today. Si? Thank you, Dermot. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, and I'm very honored to be here, Dermot, uh, with Jimmy Essig, as well as all the members from the Firearm Suppressions Unit and the great detectives and undercovers who worked this case. For my office, I uh, would like to introduce Chris Prevost to my left, who's head of our uh, Violent Crimes Enterprises Unit, or what we call VCEU, and Jamie Clydman, an assistant district attorney who was responsible for putting this case into the grand jury uh, and investigating the case with the NYPD. Uh, this will be probably my last press conference as district attorney on the issue of gun violence. And, uh, and I, like Dermot, uh, approach this morning and this moment with these guns with a, uh, with a recognition that uh, our country has absolutely failed uh, from a legislative perspective to do what it needs to do to prevent guns like these so easily flowing from other states into New York and unfortunately killing or injuring our, you know, our, our neighbors. Uh, but today's indictment is the latest effort by our office working with the NYPD to do something about it in the way that we can. Uh, Gun violence has been a steady focus of our office with the NYPD since I've been district attorney. Since we formed VCEU in 2010, from that unit alone, we have produced 42 indictments against gun traffickers, separate indictments, involving 123 traffickers, removing just from this unit alone with the NYPD more than 1,800 illegal guns from our streets. This has been a steady and relentless focus of our office, and we are still going to maintain that focus for as long as I'm district attorney, and I know my successor will do so as well. But today we're here to announce charges against four individuals, as Dermot said, for their roles in a conspiracy to sell 80 illegal and deadly firearms over the course of 15 transactions to NYPD undercover men. In total, these defendants have been indicted and are charged with 141 criminal counts, including conspiracy, 
criminal sale of a firearm and criminal possession of a weapon. Now the top charge for these individuals is criminal sale of a firearm in the first degree, which in New York State is a B felony, uh, which carries a maximum potential sentence of 25 years in prison. As I said in Dermot reference, these charges follow a proactive joint investigation between ourselves and the NYPD Firearms Investigation Unit, employing undercover buys, court-authorized wiretaps, and other investigative techniques that have to be used in order to make these kinds of cases. In the indictment, as alleged, defendant Roberto Carmona allegedly used his job as a doorman out of a midtown office building a one-man gun show, uh, storing ammunition in his locker and selling multiple deadly weapons in front of the building, which is located at 423 West 55th Street in the heart of Midtown Manhattan. He's also accused of bringing his work home with him, uh, selling dozens of guns outside his Morningside Heights building where he lives. Tennessee resident Harold Flynn supplied defendant Carmona with the majority of the firearms he's accused of selling to the undercover detective. Florin acquired many of the illegal weapons from fellow Tennessee-based defendants Alan Good and Melvin McDonald. Typically, those original purchasers, Good and McDonald, bought the guns at Tennessee gun stores and then sold them to Florin. Carmona, the mid middleman, uh, midtown doorman, then drove down to meet with Florin in Virginia, Tennessee, and New Jersey to pick up these weapons. Florin wasn't new to trafficking guns from Tennessee and New York City. In a homicide case which my office is prosecuting, Sterling Stewart is charged with murder in the second degree, among other charges, for allegedly shooting Darnell Brown, execution style, in front of an eight-year-old boy in April of 2020 on First Avenue and 101st Street. The gun used in that homicide was later linked back to Florin, one of the defendants in this case, in a Tennessee-based federal investigation into an arms sale he conducted prior to those in today's case. In fact, Florin knew he was under investigation by the feds when he sold the guns in our case. From January until September of this year, Kimona personally sold 80 firearms to the undercover detectives, ranging in prices from $500 to $3,700 per firearm. And in total, they trafficked, as you can see, most of those guns on this table, 63 semi-automatic pistols, 11 revolvers, two operable assault rifles, two rifles, one sawed-off shotgun, a uh, shotgun, and I understand 26 rounds of ammunition. And I'm not sure, uh, Commissioner, whether the guns recovered during the search warrant are on top of the 80 or included in the 80, on top of the 80. Carmona has been taken into custody, thanks really to the great work of the NYPD and its courageous under, undercover detectives, uh, who also recovered additional firearms, as I said. He was arraigned this morning in front of Judge Ann Scherzer, and he was remanded. The other three defendants have also been taken into custody and are awaiting extradition, Florin and McDonald in Tennessee, and Good in Florida, where he was arrested on vacation. Each of these men will be vigorously prosecuted by our office. Now, as today's indictment shows, not even a global pandemic is stopping the flow of guns from southern states into New York City. Earlier this morning, the Giffords Organization, an organization led by former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, installed a gun violence memorial in Battery City, featuring 1,050 vases, each for one New York State resident they calculated died as a result of gun violence last year. Now, our office and our partners will do everything we can to help organizations like the Giverts organizations and others that care deeply about reducing gun violence to help them succeed and to make this city safer. But this office certainly cannot do it alone. And my, my message is for the legislators at this point in New York State. Uh, I feel as if no amount of deaths and violence is going to get through to the legislators in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's an endless battle, and we can never stop pushing. But uh, it's a battle that they seem very resistant to wage. But in New York State, we need to strengthen penalties for wholesale gun traffickers, men who are selling the volume of guns like you see here, to discourage these people from doing business here in the first place. Under our current law in New York State, a person who sells 80 guns faces the same five-year minimum sentence as someone who sells 10 or 100 or 10,000. 
We can wait a lifetime for states like Tennessee to strengthen their non-existent gun laws, or we can raise the stakes for trafficking in New York. And that's why every year since 2016, I have proposed a new gun kingpin bill to establish the crime of operating as a major trafficking uh, trafficker of firearms. And under this statute, if you sell 20 or more firearms in the space of a year, as the defendants today are accused of, the crime would be elevated from a Class B felony to a Class A1 felony, which carries a penalty of up to 25 years in prison, analogous to the major drug trafficking statute, which New York State has. Now, Assembly Member Amy Poland has adopted our call and introduced the bill each of our last four legislative sessions. So to our colleagues in Albany, when they return to session, this important legislation is long overdue. And at the last press conference, after 42 indictments of traffickers, I don't know what more I can say or what more this office can do to try to bring home the importance of having our laws address the severity of these crimes by having statutes with have penalties severe enough both to deter their conduct and, if arrested, as these 80 guns reflected against these men do, uh, to face the consequences of potentially life in prison. Because as Dermot said, what they're doing is taking lives of our neighbors away from their families. And uh, I can't think of any law more appropriate than the New York State Legislature looking at what the facts are and establishing and passing the law that I think will protect New Yorkers in the way they deserve. Dermot, thank you. Brian? How are you doing? Uh, Inspector Brian Gill, the CEO of uh, Firearm Suppression Section. Um, District Attorney went over the case, so I'm just going to uh, introduce some of my team and the hard work they did. Um, first, uh, Detective Garth Morandi, uh, he was the case detective, did a great job, led by Captain uh, Jeff Heilick, um, Lieutenant Mike Raso, Sergeant Brian Manning, and um, Sergeant James Lundy. Um, the heroic actions to be undercover in this case, he's a very experienced undercover. He's got nothing le left to prove. I worked with the guy 10 years ago in Bronx Narcotics. He's just amazing. Like the police commissioner said, we all walked by the plaque for uh, Nemron and Andrews in our, in our office who were killed doing this exact job. It's extremely dangerous. Um, and, and you see the guns that, that uh, the undercover was able to buy in this case in such a short uh, period of time. Um, I would like to thank uh, <coughs> Chris Prevost and the DA, uh, Inspector uh, ADA Kleinman. Um, I'd like to thank the 25 FIO. He's, uh, the FIO program is a great uh, partner for us, to the eyes and ears of the police department. Concerned citizens will go into any local precinct, and, and the FIOs know where to go with the information, whether it be drugs or guns. I want to thank um, Fugitive Task Force, uh, specifically the Panama City U.S. Marshals and Tennessee U.S. Marshals, the Joint Firearm Task Force uh, with the ATF, and internally uh, the NYPD Taru and uh, NYPD Lab. Folks, uh, we're going to have Q&A on this topic only. Please limit it to one to two questions per person. I'll get to everyone, and if I have time, I'll go back around, okay? So please limit it to that. All right, Tina? Uh, Commissioner, in the West 55th Street building, the doorman who's uh, selling guns, is he selling them directly to the teenagers, or is a middleman buying them and then selling them to other people? Can you just repeat the question? I didn't hear it. The doorman on West 55th Street, is he selling like, directly to the teenagers, or is he selling to the we had electric surveillance in this case, and we are very confident we were buying all the guns. He was selling them to undercover police officer. tell us uh, I have uh, this many guns available are you interested and like I said we had electronic surveillance so we're very keen on making sure guns don't hit the streets once we dig our our fingers into a case you know we want to get all the weapons so you know we wouldn't uh, give orders but he would tell us we would have and we would say yeah we'll take them excuse me to, to us the police department no Rocco in his history though who else did he sell to and, and, and <coughs> when he first connects, I guess a few years ago, 
Yeah, so, yeah, so we're going to work it backwards with the ATF. Um, we run the guns through the lab to see if any violence is used in these weapons, but the guns are not traced out until the case is over, and now we'll be able to find out in his past how many weapons he's bought um, legally or illegally. We'll take a deep dive into all the, the, the straw purchasers that were charged with criminal sale first degree, and actually we'll find out who their associates are. So several cases could branch off this type of case. Do you know how he comes to know the people down south? He has a family relation with Florence. Uh, brother-in-law type uh, relationship. I don't like common law, but uh, they like a brother-in-law relationship. One of the suspects. Is the one, yes, the Tennessee uh, uh, Florin who was driving the guns up. Sorry, sure. I just want to make sure we're clear. Um, at this point, you, you know how many of the guns are crime guns or not? None of these guns are crime guns, but like the district attorney said, um, one of our subjects is responsible for a weapon that was used in a homicide in Manhattan, but it's not part of our investigation. Julia? Yes. Can you talk a little more about the activity at his home address at Morningside uh, Heights? What was he doing there? Was he selling there? Or was yeah. He so he, he was a doorman in midtown Manhattan. Um, on 55th Street, and he was a super at his building up in Upper Manhattan within the confines of the 26 precinct. So we did five buys in Midtown, and we did 10 buys up at his uh, residence for 15 total. He did more selling up in his own residence? Yes. Tony, over here. Uh, how affable, come on, how affable out front a doorman was it? Was it somebody who the neighbors knew, liked, walked dogs, or helped people with taxes? I don't have an answer to that question. Jonathan? Yeah, Dear Vance, you asked the question directly, what more can be done for the legislature? A lot of people are wondering what more can be done about people caught carrying guns, that there seems to be too much leniency across the five boroughs. And I was wondering, since this is your last press conference on uh, guns, uh, if your office has made any mistakes in the last two years in terms of the way you prosecuted the Gun possession cases and the other two days, uh, and that doesn't seem to have a very good lid on crime that happened up until about two, three years ago, and then we've seen the spike. Right. Any mistakes in the last year? Well, that, that spike you're seeing in Manhattan is mirrored in every major city in America. Uh, so that is not unique to New York City. But, Jonathan, I, I, I will say that our policy on gun cases has been, I think, among the five district attorney's office, as, as stricter, stricter than anyone else. And I think that's entirely appropriate. Uh, it's a Class C violent felony to possess a gun. And uh, if, there, if there are cases that we agreed to a reduction of the potential sentence. Um, it would have been after a careful analysis by the lawyers in our office, office and not done casually or, or, or without thought. So I don't believe in our office's case, and, uh, I, think, I think Dermot will back me up on this, that our, our work in guns has been strong and that there, there frankly is no more direct a crime in relation to uh, violence on the streets than possession of guns and certainly trafficking, trafficking them. Nicole? Commissioner, you said you see victims on the table here, not so much guns, but taking these guns off the street, what impact does this have on what we've been seeing in the streets as far as teenagers being shot? Yeah, I do. I do. I, uh, that's what I think about all day, every day, um, you know, because I'm constantly having conversations, whether it's internally here um, with the team, what, what can we do better, whether it's at a church or whether it's walking around at events in, in whether it's Manhattan, the Bronx or anywhere else. Um, the impact of this table is devastating New Yorkers. 1,471. That's how many New Yorkers have been shot this year in New York City as of midnight. 1,471. That doesn't even begin to tell the impact of gun violence. In, in instances where shots are fired and it traumatizes a block, or you think of somebody shot and, and lost and how it affects the whole family. I mean, that's, that's what you start at. It's great that we're preventing these guns from hitting the streets in New York. You think about where they might have. These are the guns that wind up in 15-year-olds' hands. And nothing will come from that except devastation. Um, 
I, I will say, Jonathan, you, you know my prior job and my prior work. Every gun arrest in New York City and how it moves through the process, I am aware of. We get better results in Manhattan than any other borough. That is a fact. Um, and for that teamwork over the years, Cy, um, thank you. On a personal note, thank you. It, it has been nothing but a pleasure working alongside you um, and fighting. And I, I echo his, his words. We need help. We need help with laws um, in any way, shape, or form. To This is one piece of the equation. That's another piece of the equation. And, and all of that has to come together. And we have to do it with urgency. We really do. Okay, folks, two more. Um, Commissioner, I know that you spoke openly about the fact that each one of these guns represents a business. And I wonder, because I know that you care about this deeply, how frustrating you find it that, that despite the fact that you have taken all these guns off the street, every day you see the, the sheets that come out of PCPI, just in the last few days, Times Square shooting, 72nd Street shooting, a drive-by shooting, 33rd Street, you know, a, another a gun point of robbery. It goes on and on. Times Square yesterday, on and on and on. How frustrating is it for you that despite the fact you've taken 80 guns off the street and maybe 80 or more victims will not be victims, that there's still this constant drumbeat of gun crime in New York City? And what do you think really needs to be done about it? That's a lot of questions rolled into one, right? Um, I, I, what I would say is that this is incredibly important work, and, and I don't want to overlook this work. The work of this team here, some who I've worked with over the years, um, the work of the undercover officers that do these types of cases, I can't thank them enough. Not just them, their families. Their families that know what they do and say goodbye every night and, and hope that they come home safe in the morning. Incredibly brave individuals, men and women, and what they do is incredibly important. But to your question and to, and to size earlier point, you think about what we're seeing with ghost guns right now. You think about the ability of somebody to walk into a gun show or to a gun store or a pawn shop and buy a gun and then repeat the same thing tomorrow and the next day and then get a friend. It is a, a seemingly endless stream of guns that are coming into New York City. So while these cases are incredibly important, I think the focus, and I have said this many times, Rocco, I've said it to you, I've said it to Jonathan, I've said it to nearly everyone in here, the focus has to be more so on the small number of people that carry guns, and we must deal with that side of the equation. And whether that's incarceration or programs and opportunities, but that's where the bigger problem is to me. So you're calling for stiffer penalties just as the district attorney is calling for stiffer penalties? Uh, well, I think we have very strong gun laws on the possession side. We need to enforce them. Talked about how this started with the field intelligence sergeant. Can you talk about what he or she?